Take your Bibles, if you will, please, and turn with me to the Second Timothy, chapter number four. Thank you to our brother McConkey who shared with us his heartbeat for the state of Maryland and where he's going to be planting a church. And I praise the Lord for that. Thank you for your labor. Thanks for bringing Amen. Peyton. Good job, buddy, for showing up with Dad. I'm talking to you, but you're not listening, but it's fine. <laughs> Glad you came, buddy. Thanks for Amen. coming with Dad. Hold him to the Little Caesars on the way home, though, okay? All right. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter 4. What a joy to see each of you here tonight. Thank Praise you for coming out. Amen. Many of you have been here every night that Praise you were able to, and that's powerful. So thank you Praise for that. Second Timothy chapter 4. I'm just going to read a few verses to you here. I charge thee therefore, I'm beginning to read in verse 1. I shouldn't just start. I should say, okay, verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God. That's incredible. Amen. Paul, who is an exemplary Christian, says, I am charging. To whom is he making this charge? Amen. To Timothy, Amen. his son in the ministry. Amen. And and to use the word charge is not like you would pull out your Visa or MasterCard, discover. No, this is a command, a direct Amen. command. He said, I command you. I'm, I'm charging you. I'm holding you accountable for Amen. what I'm going to tell you. But then notice, he said, I charge thee before God. So this isn't just like two guys talking right. or one guy writing another guy a letter. This is with, one, divine inspiration. Amen. Two, a divine directive. Right that is given to Timothy. I charge thee therefore before God, and then you see, and Amen. the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This is as official as you can get. Right. He's telling him, what I'm telling you, I'm telling you as God is my witness. Right. Amen. I'm telling you this in the very presence and directive from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you think Timothy's attention was gotten that way? I, it'd have mine. Pastor Moore stands up and says, I charge you before God. We're like, okay, I'm listening. <laughs> Paul is saying this. I'm trying to make up for last night where he called you an adult. Right? He, <laughs> said, he said, I have a long way to go. <laughs> Which, by the way, I should try to uh, fix Brother Magnum, Magna, Magnus. He was wrong. Just, I was just kidding. <laughs> Remember last night where I said 10 or 11 and then I kind of picked at him for not knowing his own story? Apparently he never said it. And I combined that. And I was corrected once in the men's room and again downstairs that I was wrong. So therefore, I'm just going to say he was wrong. <laughs> I was wrong for... I don't even know why. I, anyhow, I just wanted to fix this. If you were not here, this would not be like this. <laughs> I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes further in and says, Who shall judge the quick? Who are the quick? Jane. That's not first in line for tomorrow night's meal. <laughs> the quick would be the living, Amen. the alive, the quickened right. ones, and the dead. Right. So we, we are pulled into this. He's not even said what he's going to say. It's probably how you know he's a Baptist preacher. A long on-ramp. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing Amen. and his kingdom. Amen. Here's the charge. Preach the word. Amen. Be instant, in season, the Lord. out of season, Amen. reprove, right. rebuke, Exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Amen. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. You say, well, wonder when that time is. Just walk down the street, is all I can tell you. This is weird. Paul was telling us there's coming a time where people aren't going to put up with, if I said it to you this way, I think you'll understand, straight hard preaching. They're just not going to put up with it. You say, but boy, those churches, they have the coolest names. They have the easiest going preacher. Skinny jeans, dark to... Oh, it's not happening. Skin 
Why don't we? I mean, but look at their numbers. Their numbers are incredible. And the time will come where they won't endure sound doctrine. What are they going to do? Well, notice Paul's telling Timothy. As if this was going to happen in Timothy's day, and it did, and it is happening in our day, it has always been. We have never been the majority religion of Christianity. We were never intended to be that. We are supposed to be light in darkness and salt in death. That is our job, that we show forth Christ. And we don't back up on what we believe. What are they going to do? He said they're gonna, there's going to come a time where they'll not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Give us the cool preachers. Give us the preachers that don't make us feel bad. Give us the preachers that won't call sin, sin. Give us the preachers who will change their position with whatever the latest demographic report says. That's not us. Amen. We may not have the largest crowds anymore, though once we did. But we ought to stand tall Amen. on the truth of these verses right. that pure doctrine, right doctrine, sound doctrine Amen. is important. Why? We are going to send these kids into a generation that we will not be here to help them. And everything they know about God, they're going to get from us. Amen. And if we don't give them sound doctrine, what are they going to do? Right. How are they going to make it? Amen. And so Paul is writing Timothy. And the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, the give us teachers we want, the lust, their desire, shall they heap to themselves teachers. And what will they do? They'll just run from teacher to teacher and church to church. And this church doesn't fit me anymore, so I'll go to the next church and I'll go to the next church. And they'll run all about just trying to find out what's your kids' program like? What's your youth program like? What's, what do you have for moms on Tuesdays? What do you have for dads on Thursdays? What do you have? And we're just running around trying to find... It's kind of like VBS season in a community. We'll just take the kids from church to church and it's free child care in the morning every week during the summer. It's missions conference, but I had to kind of throw something in there. That's what we do. Not caring about the doctrine that our kids are being exposed. Running around trying to find the coolest program to plug our people into. No. They have itching ears, verse 3. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But, watch thou in all things. Amen. These are the charges Paul is giving to Timothy before God, Amen. before the Lord Jesus right. Christ, and he's telling him, this is who you have to be. Amen. Watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Amen. Do the work of an evangelist. Amen. Make full proof of thy ministry. Amen. Do you realize that in our country, four in ten, so out of every ten people, four of them do not believe in God. So where, 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 where did you say that was? America. They will identify as atheists or atheistic and agnostic. They disagree that faith is an important part in their life. They've not prayed to God in at least the last year. They've never made a commitment to Christ. They disagree that the Bible is accurate. They have not donated money to a church in the last year. They believe that Jesus committed sins. They do not have a responsibility to quote, show, share their faith. They've not read their Bible. They've not volunteered at a church. They've not attended Sunday school. And they've not attended any religious small group of any kind. God help us. Where is that? Here. 
So you have a church planner who wants to go to Maryland. I, I will not even attempt to pronounce it like that because I feel like it's an abomination to the French language to pronounce it like you do. However, the harbor of grace, that we, will, that we are going to be able to have a guy who's willing to go there and preach the gospel, realize he is reaching the same kind of people which live here. People who are just like this, four in ten Americans don't even have any connection to church. They have either never been to church or they have de-churched. That is to say, they've unhooked from church and haven't been to church in years. Even in your own video presentation. This is where I got in trouble last night. You had a lady who said that she hadn't been to church in five years. She said she met you at the substation. Is that like where hoagies come from? The dump. Yes. That was my second one. I thought, no, he's a food guy. He's, you know, but so there you go. Last night I said, you always be prepared to have a harvest conversation with the women at the well. He was talking about Christ at the dump. So you can do that? You can do that. But what did the lady say? Five years hadn't been in church. Four in ten Americans don't go. I'm reminded it's a very old illustration, but it's quite appropriate. Two shoe salesmen left from England on a ship. That'll let you know. It wasn't a cruise ship. They left from England on a ship and traveled to a port in Africa. They get there. They're shoe salesmen. The one guy gets off and he looks and he looks at all the people and none of them are wearing shoes and he says, I'm going home. None of these people wear shoes. The other guy says, double my order when you get there. He said, are you crazy? He said, no, none of these people wear shoes. Why? Everybody was a customer. When you go out and bring the gospel to the lost, everybody is a customer. Every person is wired for life. Every man can be saved. It's up to us to say, am I seeing it as I should see it? So you say, okay, now help me. Paul's talking to Timothy, and you're talking to us like Paul talked to Timothy. Amen. Yes, because I believe this applies. There's an easy application for us in these verses. But I do not want you to get away from the fact that saying, well, wow, I'm gl glad he's going to that town in Maryland, and he's going to be able to plant a church there. That's great. Those people really need it. Want to say it again? Right. Those people, they really need it. Amen. And the same down here, right. or over here and down, Amen. I guess. Over here right. and over there. Right. Same problem. Right. Four in ten have nothing to do with church. And either you'll look at that and say, let's pull everybody back and we'll hide in our little circle and we'll circle the wagons and we'll hold the fort till Jesus comes. Or you'll say, they don't wear shoes. I'm going. Four in ten will not even be connected to church. That's our job. I want to speak to you tonight and try to get you out before the 24-hour Walmart closes. About our relationship to the gospel. And so you have your place in your notes, and I'm going to give you four simple thoughts as I read from verse 1 to really just verse number 2. I'm only going to cover two verses there. But the very first thing I want you to see is, number one, we have a gospel accountability. Amen. Right. How do I know that? He's charging Timothy before God. 
He's charging Timothy before the Lord Jesus Christ. He's charging Timothy and telling him that God is going to judge the quick and the dead at His appearing. Paul told the church at Corinth in his second letter, he said, "For and you can write this reference down, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Amen. You say, well, I, I thought, I didn't think we were going to get judged. And I, no, I don't want you to confuse great white throne judgment with the... Bema seat. That's kind of it's kind of a playing into a Greek word that helps us understand that when Olympians and athletes ran their races and had their athletic exercises, that they would stand in front of a judge's table, and at that judge's table they would receive their reward for their race. We will stand before our God and Amen. Savior, and at that point we will receive the things done in the body, whether good or bad. Praise the Lord. I'm not. I'm appearing at that judgment seat not because I earned it. Amen. I'm there because He paid the price to release me from bondage Amen. and declared me legally righteous. That's why I'm there. Lost people don't make it to that judgment throne. But understand this. I will give an account. There is an accountability. There's a second verse you could write down, and that is Romans 14, 9, and 10. For to this end, both Christ both died and rose and revived, that He might be the Lord of the dead and the living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat Amen. of Christ. You and I have a gospel accountability. Right. Amen. You say, I, I don't know if I buy in. You don't have to buy in. It's the truth. Jesus. You say, well, but, but are there like any exemptions? No. Amen. We'll stand before God. So number one, what did you write down? We have a gospel accountability. Right. Here's the second thing I see that Paul is telling Timothy. We have a gospel message. Look at Amen. verse number two. Preach the word. What does the Word of God do? It brings peace with God. It brings pardon from God. It brings just the justification of God. The Word of God brings redemption. And He chose the method of delivery. You say it's the most ridiculous method to get somebody up there, take the Word of God, and holler at people for between 30 and 90 minutes. I'm just giving you a goal here. To get them and say, that's the communication method God chose? Praise yes. But the key to that is, it's not just hollering. You're to take the Word of God. Amen. The joy that you have here is you have a preacher who will preach the Word Praise of God. Amen. The day comes where a preacher is not preaching the Word of God, and he's preaching his opinions and his ideas, and there is no foundation or no scripture for that, you have a problem at your church. We are not here to preach personalities. We are not here to entertain people. We are here to, for one thing. We have a gospel message. The only thing which will change your community to where you're going and this community, community where we are is the fact that we have a gospel message. Number one, we have a gospel accountability. Number two, we have a gospel message. Number three, we have a gospel opportunity. Notice what he says. Preach the word. Next part of verse two. Be instant, in season, out of season. Amen. That is to be ready for gospel conversations right. with the lost, whether you're at Chick-fil-A or the dump. Amen. Somebody go by and find out his story and come back and tell me what happened at the dump that day. Harvest conversations. We're to be ready for those at any time. Right. Conversations Amen. about light in a world of darkness. We're to be looking for those opportunities ready for the opportunity that we have. So number one, we have a gospel accountability. Number two, we have a gospel message. Number three, we have a gospel opportunity that we can go anywhere at any time and bring the gospel. You say, well, I don't want to mess up. You won't mess up. You can't bring the gospel to the wrong address. Four in ten, don't wear shoes. 
if you're just tuning in now and you don't understand that statement, rewind, go back at the beginning, and then you'll understand. What we're saying is, is that everybody is an opportunity to present the gospel. We have a gospel message. We have gospel accountability. We'll stand before God. We have a gospel opportunity. And that is to say that we're to be instant, in season, out of season. Amen. And lastly, we have a gospel responsibility. What is our gospel responsibility? Verse 2, to reprove. What is to reprove? It's to correct the mind. Amen. We're to rebuke. What does that mean? To correct the heart. Amen. We are to exhort. Amen. What does that mean? To admonish and encourage. Right. That's our job. Amen. Correct the mind, correct the heart, admonish and encourage. And what do we do that with? The Word of God. Amen. Here's what's happened. I, I, as churches, we've lost our courage. Do you understand what I mean when I say that? Where there was an era where we, as churches, informed culture right. what Amen. was right and wrong. Right. There was a time where we, as churches, informed government as to what was right and what was wrong. There was a time where we, as churches, informed the home as to what is right and what is wrong, but we've lost our courage. Our courage has dwindled. We've allowed culture to tell church what to do. We've allowed government to tell church what to do. We've allowed schools to tell the home what to do. And so all of a sudden the church has become impotent and nobody is standing with courage. And if anybody does, we're just going to find the next teacher that because we have itching ears that we're trying to heap to ourselves and fulfill the desires of our lust. No, it is our job to say to culture, that is abhorrent, that is against the will of God and against the Word of God. Amen. So, well, we're, we're not supposed to be correcting anything about government. No! My soul on earth! Our country is just a kid in comparison to the age Amen. of the Word of God. Right. God was here before any government right. was instituted. I said, well, we just, we're just going to, we don't want to offend anybody. Hmm. Hell is filled with people who wished you had offended them. Right. Culture says, oh, you can't say that anymore. You can't do that anymore. Culture says this is acceptable and this is acceptable. Nothing is acceptable unless God's Word says it's acceptable. You say, well, we're in the minority. Then speak up. Amen. Minorities get a lot of privileges in our country. Speak up. Amen. We inform government. We inform culture. Amen. We inform the home. Well, they said down at the school, we have to let this happen and we have to let that happen. And Timmy's got a little baseball game and Johnny's got this going on over here. And, and we can't, we're just going to miss all summer of church because this year we've got our kids in sports. And you know, there's a possibility he could be a pro ball player and we want to just foster his growth. When your kid can't play, what is he going to have? No, we inform the home. The Word of God informs the home. So when we look at the, the relationship we have with the gospel, we have to understand we have a gospel accountability, we have a gospel message, we have a gospel opportunity, and we have a gospel responsibility. Reprove, rebuke, Amen. exhort. Amen. Tonight I ask you one thing. Are you prepared? I, just, we'll just deal with point one. Are you prepared for the accountability? Say, Brother O'Malley. I think it's easier to deal with it on this side of the grave or the rapture than it is the other side of the grave or the rapture. Gospel accountability. What is accountability? You go into your home and there's probably a room that has the scale. I was in a friend's home recently. They put the scale in front of the refrigerator in the kitchen. It's like, this is like 
really on edge. I'm going to evaluate our friendship just based on that. But you go into the bathroom and there's the scale. And if you have the courage to stand on it, it's going to reflect a number that one, you're going to deny and you're going to recalculate what it really should be and whatever. But it is a version of the truth. When we get before the Lord, that's the divine scale. How many did I not tell? Right. Yes, let's get the, get the gospel. Plant a church in Maryland, sure. Let's plant a church in Mexico City. Amen. Yeah? But what are you doing here? Right. If you really want to understand missions, go door to door here. Because right. yeah. then you'll realize, oh, we're asking them to go do the same thing that we're right. doing. Right. Amen. Would you stand with me?